My name is Rusty Pylover, ginger streamer, professional high pitch screamer, and now podcast host extraordinaire. Welcome, listeners, to the Pie Oven Podcast, where we delve deep into the glorious pies that uh, come and join us on the show. We delve deep into their filling, we delve deep into their crust. This is all sounding so very weird for an intro. I am joined by the esteemed, I would, uh, I don't know if I would like to say this this way, but basically the esports goddess of South Africa, Tech Girl. That was a hectic intro. Also, I'm so hungry now because I keep thinking about pies, but there you go. Well, let's let's start off with probably the hardest question of the podcast all right and i usually split these two because you can't just have one what are your favorite pies both savory and sweet so savory is there's a chicken pie that you can get in harder beer sports at this like little chicken pie harder beer sport is a, a spot in Gauteng, uh, which is the province that i live in and that chicken pie is always the, the chicken pie you buy when you're on your way back from Hearties. And the only time I've ever been on my way back from Hearties is normally coming back from a music festival where you're starving. Best chicken pies ever. So that's the savory one. Um, sweets is, I've this has actually uh, changed recently because I have some American friends. And last year, I got included in two American Thanksgiving dinners. And they make something called pumpkin pie, which you then have whipped cream on. It's my favorite thing on the planet. Uh, I've actually learned to make it now. Pumpkin pie is, it sounds horrible because vegetables, but it is the best thing. I can eat a whole pumpkin pie and I know because I have in like one sitting. You'll be sick, but best, best, that that's the best pie period actually. But there you go. I'll make you one one day, Rusty. I look forward to it, but uh, just just remember when you say best pie and you're talking to the pie lover himself, you you, you best know that I'm going to be severely judging you with extreme prejudice if that is not the best pie you claim it to be. I am not wrong about food 90% of the time, so I, I have no fear. Pumpkin but you could be wrong about pie. No, I'm not wrong about this one. <laughs> Dude, pumpkin pie, man. I will die on, I will die on this hill. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's impressive to me that you say that you could eat a whole pumpkin pie because I... I've I've, I've um, had some American viewers on stream, and I'm sure a lot of uh, listeners that do stream have had some American viewers talk about Thanksgiving. I believe it's like a, a, a tradition to eat yourself stupid and then unbuckle your pants and complain about how much you've eaten, and then just to go back for that beautiful, sweet little taste of pumpkin pie. I mean, that's me at pretty much every meal, so... <laughs> so same, speaking- same. Speaking of meal plans, uh, friend, you recently have been uh, doing uh, quite a rough gym session. And how has that been treating you? How's the dietary? Did you have to make any dietary changes? Uh, What would your advice be about going to the gym? Do you still like going to the gym? Uh, All of those healthy stuff. This is turned into a health podcast, everyone. So for those that don't like gymming, I would advise mute and come back in like three minutes. No, I think if you don't like Jimmy, you need to listen because I am <laughs> I promise you I'm going to convince you with my story. Uh, I have struggled with my weight my whole life. I've always been on the chubby side uh, and sometimes extremely overweight. And I've always struggled with my relationship with food. This is going to get really deep, <laughs> very deep, very fast. But I've always struggled with my relationship with food. So I am what they call an emotional eater. And I know that these are all like buzzwords that you hear. But the truth is when I'm sad, I eat. So I really struggle with online criticism. I struggle if I feel like I've done a bad job. I I pretend to be a badass bitch, but the truth is I'm so soft and squishy on the inside. So if anyone says anything remotely mean, I fall to pieces. And my solution was to eat all the time. Uh, So I had a really bad relationship with food. Uh, I wouldn't eat in public, ironically enough. So you would see me at an, maybe I was at an event and you'd see me like nibble on something, uh, but but you didn't really see me like sit down and eat because I'd go home and binge normally because I was an emotional mess and then towards uh, about sort of three years ago I started to struggle I couldn't get out of bed and I'm like I, I'm go 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 all the time I want to do all the things I constantly overbook myself and I wasn't even able to get out of bed I was really struggling and a friend a very good friend of mine was like you need to go see a doctor I think you need to take blood tests like you don't look good 
went to a doctor, I took some blood tests and it turned out I had a thyroid problem. And being the horrible person that I am, I was like, nah, there's no such thing as a thyroid problem. That's just what overweight people use as an excuse to eat too much. But the doctor showed me on my bloods and not only did I now have a thyroid problem, my thyroid was underactive, but it affected a host of, of issues. Uh, so I had all sorts of other health issues, an iron deficiency, a vitamin B deficiency, a vitamin D deficiency. My hair was falling out. There was so many things. So they started putting me on all these uh, different thyroid medications to try to find one that would work. And no matter what we did, we just could not get one to work. My thyroid just got worse. I got made to go on all these hectic diets. I went to go see dietitians. They told me to change the way I eat. No matter what I did, my thyroid just got worse and worse. Cross to, to that. So I'm busy trying every hormone medication on the planet, which doesn't help your body. Um, but I hit quite a like depressive down spot to the middle of last year where I just, I felt so, and it's, it's a weird one, but I just felt so useless, which is funny because I think without sounding like I'm talking up my own ass, I think a lot of people will look at my persona online and be like, yo, that girl, all the luck, it's all the, you know, like her life just looks the way I want my life to be. But the truth was I was hating life. I felt so miserable. I felt so useless. I, I had this weird thing that like, you know, like I was, I was past my shelf life and I didn't know what I was doing with my life and everything, you know how it gets used. I think everyone found themselves in this weird, like depressive bubble during COVID. Um, and so I decided to start moving not to lose weight, but I just, the one thing that bugged me was that physically I wasn't strong. Like I, I couldn't even pull myself up. And I was like, if the zombies ever come, I'm the first one that's going to die. <laughs> so I, I had been following a, a friend of mine, Mups. He, he's on the cover of DQ. So he's like on a whole different fitness level. Uh, he had this trainer. Uh, his name was, was Oliver Gash, Oli. Uh, he was, Oli's an ex-professional footballer. He trains a bunch of footballers. And I just liked, uh, Maps used to share his workouts and I just kind of liked them. They were like different. It, it wasn't like the typical like gym boot weight thing. Like Maps would be like jumping over like hurdles and doing weird things. So I went for a test with Oli, signed up with him for a month. And it's now been a year. I am... The, sh the most important is I am the strongest and the fittest I have ever been in my entire life. And I did lose about 13 kilos along the way, um, but I'm strong, which is what I actually care about and fit. And uh, ironically, a few things changed along the way. So one, my thyroid, uh, it normalized, we found medication and it normalized itself. Uh, so it, it actually, all my levels are fine. I'll be on medication for the rest of my life, but we seem to have found the one that works. And I do think that the, the training and the working out helped. Uh, but I also joined up with a, a, a lovely woman called Jade who runs a company called Just Lose It. Now I feel like I'm just shrilling for all of these people. <laughs> I paid them all money. I paid them all money. So, so I put my money down. But she changed my relationship with food. So what's really interesting is lots of people now when they see me with you know me being fit and training, they're like, oh, what diet are you on? This is the first time in my life, and I have done every diet on the planet. I have followed every regime. So it's the first time in my life I am on, it's not even a diet. She just taught me to have a better relationship with food, to understand what my triggers were, why I would go binge, and then also just make better choices. And that always sounds so cliche when people say that, but like legit, I still eat, like I'll eat a slab of Top Deck if I'm having a bad day. I drink like way too much Red Bull. Um, but I can do all of that and then I can still, I live my life. I don't, I'm not on a restrictive diet. I think about two weeks ago from recording this, I flew to Sweden for the first time in two years. I got to go to an actual studio uh, to do some esports work. And before, two years ago, when I used to fly to esports events, I used to panic because I can't eat the food on the plane. There's too many carbs. They're, they're going to serve us pizza when we're there. I can't eat pizza. There's always chocolate snacks. Oh, my gosh, I'm going to have this terrible time. And I'd end up starving myself the entire trip. And then on the last night in the hotel, binging on a bunch of food that I'd bought from like a la McDonald's or, or wherever else. This was the first time I went overseas and I ate whatever I wanted. And, and I knew how to handle it because my relationship with food was different. So... It's been like a complete life change. Uh, and now I've just spoken for a gazillion minutes. So I apologize about that. But the, it, it's really changed my life. And I think the most important thing about the gym, like where you mentioned, if, if you don't like gym, I hated exercise. Like I am a lazy mother trucker. Like I am lazy. But I found someone, and I don't think you necessarily need to go pay a personal trainer. I think I just found things 
that engaged my mind. So the focus was less on let's go run on this treadmill, which by the way, I still hate running, but it was more like, okay, cool. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to do all these fun things. Like we're going to, you know, jump on boxes and do plyometrics. And those are going to make you, uh, that they're going to make you stronger. And when you run, it'll be easier. And that for me was the biggest thing was learning the different things that I'm doing, how it benefits other things. Uh, and now I can run, I mean, I can run, I still don't like it, but I can squat more than my body weight. I can deadlift more than my body weight and I can, I've learned to box. Uh, I've learned so many skills. So I think that even if you're afraid of the gym, the most important thing you can do is just move. So even if it's just spending an hour walking around outside, it's so important. And it's honestly saved my life because like I mentioned, I was in such a depressive state and I used to get so emotional about like, what people said about me or if people didn't like me or if content didn't do well or if someone was mean to me in a chat. Now, once a day, when I start to feel that sort of, that weight on my shoulders, I'm just like, cool, I'm going to go to gym. And that's my hour to just go and uh, fight the demons, if you like. And I feel so much better. And ironically, that stuff doesn't make me as angry anymore. The internet doesn't really <laughs> anger me anymore. Now, sometimes I'm just like, oh, it's cool. I'll just go outside and like, like I started longboarding I'll just go and jump on my board and I'll feel better so that's my very long I think it was like 15 minutes of me talking trying to um <laughs> sell you on the healthy lifestyle but there you go that is a great sales pitch but you've always been great at sales pitches so everyone in chat if you have not you see I'm I'm I'm, I'm so used to being live and talking about chat but the the the, the viewers that comment <laughs> is chat that's that's what we're calling them from now on everyone who comes to the pie oven podcast your chat all right so it'll just make my life easier <laughs> but um it's, it's really inspirational um and there's two topics I'm, I'm gonna touch on just now but it's really inspirational to to uh know that this kind of journey um anyone you, you know if you if you take those first steps even if it's small steps you're still taking steps uh towards just making things better for you so so the two the two topics I wanted to touch on there in, in that uh, that advert that you put out for us. Um, <laughs> the first one, you mentioned that you went to Sweden for a um, uh, an esports event. And I want to touch on this because uh, for those that don't know, I've known Tech Girl since I started doing YouTube back in 2013. Um, we didn't get to chat much. Only later on did we get to chat a little bit more. Um, and just from my part... Uh, Sam is one of those people that uh, put in 500% in, in the scene and has had to deal with uh, people naysaying. And, you know, everyone that does content are going to have naysayers. But if there's one person that has powered through uh, a lot of criticism and tried to bring a whole new uh, dynamic to the esports scene in our local South African scene, uh, from my side, Sam, thank you so much for all the hard work that you have put into the scene, seriously. It is an honor to know you as an individual, and it's an honor to know you as Tech Girl. And uh, anyone who has not followed her, uh, she'll be plugging all of her her uh, links at, at the end of the, the, the Pie Oven podcast. But uh, please go make sure to give her all the love, because if there's one person that has worked their tail off in the scene, and I have personally witnessed it, for the last almost 10 years, it is this amazing, powerful individual. So, um, yeah, go do that. But uh, let's let's dive a little bit into that journey. Um, what made you get into the, the, the esports scene specifically? And um, tell us about some of your best adventures. I'm, I'm genuinely keen to hear about this. So I'm going to – I'll answer those. But I, I have to say, I mean, I appreciate the kind words, but I, I definitely – think that there's so many individuals in this industry who maybe aren't camera facing or public uh, that are behind the scenes that have done amazing things. So I appreciate the words and I like to think I've made a difference, but there's so many other people along the way who, who also made a difference um, and, and changed up the scene. We will, we will get them all on the podcast eventually. I'll all just give you, I, you just give me all a list of names and I'll get to them eventually. <laughs> that would be amazing. So to start, how did I get into esports? So contrary to popular belief uh, lots of people say that I did it because it was money making which I always find funny because when I started you couldn't make money in in esports everyone was a volunteer um, but so what happened was is growing up uh, my, my family my dad and my brother were always gamers my, my dad specifically so from a young age my brother and I were allowed to game 
um, and we had we were still talking. We were actually talking about this the other day. We used to play this game called Eagle Eye Mysteries, which apparently no one knows about because I tweeted about it, and no one knew about Eagle Eye Mysteries. It was most it was the funnest game. Go Google that. We used to that was our thing. My brother and I used to play Eagle Eye Mysteries. We had like a million different boxes of that game. Um, but we play games. My brother obviously got really good um, and started playing online with his mates. I in high school sort of stopped playing games because you know it wasn't cool and in. I'm giving away my age, but in those days, if you played games, you were like a super nerd and I was a girl and, and I felt like I got teased a lot and I kind of distanced myself from it, whereas my brother carried on. So he started playing online um, and got into Dota and, and actually put a team together with his friends and they started competing and they would always play the, under the pretense of coming to our house to study. They'd all bring their PCs and they'd land. So I spent a lot of time sitting on the couch listening to them play games. Uh, and at that point, I'd started playing games again, but it was like very on the down low. Like I wasn't playing online because um, I suck at games 90% of the time, but I still love playing them. But I think that's uh, most people. Uh, but I would listen to them talk and then I'd come and watch them play. So I'd sometimes just stand by my brother and, and watch him play. And I think what, it, what ended up happening is I just got really invested in the stories that they would tell because they would talk about like other players or like some person that they'd come across online and how phenomenally talented that person was. And I was like, these stories are amazing. And then they'd tell me like land stories about like what happened at land. And I was like, these are such cool stories. And no one talks like, no, why is no one talking about these? Because these are like, these are cool people. Like this is like really, for me, that was really interesting. And then obviously listening to them when they were playing games and listening to the team I obviously was sitting in in the lounge while they were playing in the dining room so I could hear the conversations I found the team chats really fascinating I obviously loved games I was playing games as well I loved uh, I, I loved all of it so putting it all together I was like wow there's like there's such a cool story here and I'm an I'm a storyteller that's I've always said that like I don't like being the story I like telling other people's stories so I just started you know, becoming more and more involved in that and listening, but not really on the scene in the sense that like no one really saw me. I was there. I, I've been at Rage in the basement watching my brother play. There's pictures of me from years ago uh, with some of my friends, but people didn't know who I was. It wasn't like I was out there being like, oh my gosh, I'm a content creator. We didn't do that then. So I was just watching. And I had this blog that I'd started where I specifically spoke about tech stuff. And then what happened was, is that Telcom, uh, now VS Gaming, announced this like big million rand prize pool event. And this was going to be like the biggest esports event of all time. And I got invited through my blog to the launch of this announcement. And one of the, he's going to kill me for bringing him up, but one of the players who had now moved on to Bravado Gaming was one of the guys, one of my brother's friends who used to play at our house. His name is Ashton Goldsmuller. He now is the, the founder of Goliath Gaming, which is a big esports organization. But he used to play for Bravado. And I remember this night, we were at this launch, and he came up to me. And now you have to understand, I've known this, I've known Ash for so many years. Goals, I should probably call him Goals. I've known Goals for so many years. I've, like, I've watched him grow up, and he's watched me grow up. And he came running over to me at this event, and he was like, this is the best day ever. This is finally happening. And I knew that all of these, these players had battled to convince their parents that this was a legitimate thing. You know, obviously people at that stage, you were still a nerd if you played games. And he was so excited. I just remember how excited he was, where he was like, this is it. This is where everything changes. And I looked around because at that point I, I worked uh, at a radio station. So I worked in media and I was like, all the media here are just here to like, kiss telecom ass like they just want advertising money they don't care about esports i was like they they'll write about this tonight because they have to but tomorrow they won't remember any of this and they won't follow up on this and they won't they don't care about esports and i kind of was like but i do and i'm gonna keep telling these stories and i actually wrote a blog post the next day it's still on my website where i said from here on out i'm gonna tell these stories because no one else is going to um, and I said it, I just don't think enough people read it. And then from there on, I started writing stories about esports. I started making really cringe YouTube videos about esports. I started going to the events with my camera, trying to record it, tweeting about it before people were even on Twitter and like just constantly trying to like tell these stories because I said I was going to, and I made it clear that I wanted to do it for the players, which has always been why I'm involved in esports. And then I don't know what happened. One day someone was like, oh, look, there, there's a girl. We need a girl on stage. I knew I was the d diversity hire. They said, oh, do you want to do some interviews on camera? I wanted to because I wanted to tell my story. And even though I knew that they were hiring me because I was a woman, I was like, ha, 
you give me the platform, my mission continues. Uh, so I took the job and got spotted by um, a, a gent called Paul Red Eye Chalona, who was at one stage one of the biggest esports personalities in the world. And he said to me, you know, if you're serious about this, I can help you. Like you, there's some natural talent there. You need a lot of work, um, but I can get you work overseas. I laughed at him, thought he was joking. Um, and then like two months later, I realized I hated my day job and I wanted to quit. So I phoned him and I was like, were you serious? And he said, yes. And I happened to be in London for work, met up with him and then spent months with him just criticizing all my VODs. I used to send him VODs and he made me cry a few times because he was quite, he wasn't harsh. He was uh, critical and I needed that. I kept working at it, sent him some more VODs and then they got me a job hosting a stage at Gamescom for ESL and that was my first international event and I think other than Quick Shots, who's on League of Legends, I was the second South African to get flown to an international event to work uh, and the rest was history. Then all of a sudden it was a job and now I've been able to travel around the world and work on a bunch of esports things. It's now my full-time gig, which is kind of cool. And then I always come home. People always say, why didn't you move overseas? And I've always said it's because my mission was always to build the stories of the esports players in South Africa. So I come home and I try and bring what I've learned home. And I try and do my little piece to, to make our little industry a little bit better. Uh, some days I feel like there's no hope. But other days I feel like we are making some steps. And yeah, that's that's my story. I have some funny and I can tell you some random funny things as well that have happened along the way, but that's, that's kind of the, the main story, if you like. <laughs> that is, that's so cool to hear. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Red Eye myself, had the, uh, the, the opportunity of meeting him, uh, mostly from the, the Dota 2 cast days um, and things like that. It was, it was really cool, met him at Rage. I didn't realize he was so short um, when I initially met him. But then again, most of the people that I have met over the years turned out to be a little bit shorter than I thought, you included. Um, <laughs> it was it was like I'm when I... I'm not short. Maybe the problem is you're tall because I'm not okay, short. Okay, okay. Like but now... I have this argument with lots of people because <laughs> I was like, you're short. And I'm like, no, I'm average height. You're just tall. Okay, but now it's like Grant. Grant is short. Grant's shorter than me, yes. Grant Hines is in fact Grant than is me. a teeny tiny man. I, I've, again, I, people don't understand how many people I have met in the scene that, that I dearly very much love. Um, they are all amazing people, and I'm, I'm proud to be part of that scene. Um, to, to, to touch on a little bit more of a serious subject, um, as you mentioned, you were talking about uh, hitting those, lo those lows, those deep depression lows, and I feel at least recently or even just prior before COVID, um, during the pandemic, we've seen a meteoric rise of streamers, content creators, esports players in the local scene. But I've also seen a meteoric rise in um, de uh, depression, uh, people having bad days, people feeling that uh, things are not worth continuing for. Um, in your opinion, since uh, we're, we're, we're going deep now, listeners, we're going deep. How did you get past that sense of self-doubt, that imposter syndrome that a lot of people struggle? I, I recently got out of that uh, rut. Um, I myself turned off all of my analytics. I, and I've been doing this a long time. You know, I've been a content creator for like almost 10 years. Um, and I think it's what a lot of people don't understand about content is you can have a meteoric rise and a meteoric fall. This is not an easy journey for anyone, whether it's in esports, streaming, YouTubing, Instagram, OnlyFans, that is content. For those that uh, like like to judge that part of the world, it is content. Um, how do you deal as someone, and I don't want to put it like <laughs> um, in a wrong way, but someone... In, uh, like yourself that has been in the scene for so long and has established themselves for so long how do how do you deal or have dealt with that those intrusive thoughts that make you say okay i don't want to do this anymore this is too hard these people are trolling me uh i can't do this anymore is it all worth it and even when you find the success do you still feel there are days where it's difficult to want to continue this so I still have imposter syndrome. It's something I suffer from. And I, I think 
there's a long answer to your question. So, so I don't, I know people call me a content creator. I don't necessarily consider myself a content creator. Um, but I make content. So I suppose I am when I got into this, like I said, I always wanted to tell stories. That's, um, that's what I love to do. I didn't want to be the story. I just wanted to tell it. And, and I felt like esports shout casting and hosting suited me well because you you're not supposed to be the star if people are talking about the host or the shout caster you're not doing your job they need to be talking about the game and the players and i kind of loved that that was something i could do where i wouldn't necessarily be the star i could just facilitate creating the star uh so i struggle i mean i do still struggle with criticism uh because in my mind, and maybe I'm a bit older now and I realize it's not quite like this, but in my mind when I started, I, I never understood why people were hating on me. Because I'd be like, okay, cool, like, give me advice to improve, but don't hate on me as a person. It's not about me. It's it's about the story I'm telling or the game I'm commentating on. Please don't hate on me. I, I couldn't understand why I became the focus of, of criticism. And then as you get older and, and wiser, I suppose you start to realize that unfortunately when you put yourself out there, of course people, you know, you there, there is a certain level of as much as you say you don't want to be the star. The truth of it is if you're creating these platforms and you're creating content, there is there's only one reason you, there's lots of reasons you create content, but the, you know, there's an attention seeking point to it. Uh, and I think coming to terms with that and realizing that even if you want to tell other people's stories, you're still asking for people's attention when you do that. You're saying, come, look at what I have to say, because if I tell you this story, you know, it'll be a good story. So, so there's still a, a, a level of me and I involved. And I think all content creators and streamers and, and anything like that, there, there is a, a certain level of insecurity i think that you do this you do this whether you do it the way that the, the way i've done it where you want to tell other people's stories or whether you want to be the story as the streamer there's a level of insecurity that comes with it you're doing it because you're craving some sort of attention and more importantly than attention you're craving some sort of validation so maybe you haven't got that somewhere else in your in your life but you're ultimately creating a situation where your job if you want to make it a full-time thing or your hobby is about trying to get validation from these people on the internet who you probably don't know um and unfortunately, the moment you go out saying, hey, look at me or listen to me or read what I wrote, someone somewhere, whether you like it or not, is going to stand up and go, nah, I think that's crap. And maybe they think it's crap because they don't like your face. Maybe they think it's crap because they think you're fat. Maybe they think it's crap because you're not attractive. Maybe they think it's crap because it is crap. Well, for whatever reason, they're going to find that thing and they're not going to like you. And they're going to tell you because you came out publicly and asked for it uh you said give me your attention and they're going to say no and, and here's why not and it's it's hard to to deal with that um i still don't have the answer as to how uh, you deal with it i just think that well, what i constantly have to remind myself is for every you know we we focus we'll remember every negative comment so say you put up a video or you do a live stream so, so let's say i do a live stream and like i said to you uh, i'm working on an esports event um and I'm not the story, right? So no, if people are talking about me, I haven't done my job. So the first three hours of the broadcast, not a single thing is said about me. They're all talking about the game and everyone's enjoying it and they're talking about the players. And then there's one line where someone calls me cringe or ugly. That's the line I remember. That's the one at night that I think about, as opposed to all these people in the chat talking about how much fun they were having, how much they were enjoying the show, how much they were enjoying the game. So yes, it might not be about me, but I was obviously doing my job because they were enjoying it. But I'll remember that one person who called me cringe and then try and figure out if it was cringe or not. And I think I think depression, the, the depression side of it comes in because it can be, we're out there looking for, like I said, validation and attention. So when we get that negativity back, it, it hits us quite hard because you're putting a little bit, a little piece of your soul out there. I think the reason we've seen more about it in, in recent years and more communication about it is because people are more open about speaking about it. Um, if you if you look back over the years from before the, the day of social media, there's a lot of people out there, creators, not necessarily just in gaming, but creators in general who'll tell you that like 
photographers, movie directors, actors, actresses, presenters, sports commentators, that they dealt with very similar things. There just wasn't really a platform to talk about it. And also if you did talk about it, people would be like, oh, stop being soft, you know? Whereas I think now society's kind of changed the the focus and, and it's it's okay to talk about the mental struggles. And now we have platforms to do it, like Twitter and Instagram. So that's why we see more of it. But I, I think it's just unfortunately something that comes with the job. And anyone... I stand by this. I'll piss someone off saying this, but anyone who says that they don't, it doesn't get to them, is lying. It gets to them at some point. If you're creating content or you're on a, you're an esports broadcaster or whatever else, if someone says something, it gets at some point. It's going to get to you. So anyone who says, "Oh, I just ignore the haters," that's what they're telling themselves because it, it helps them cope, and I'm okay with that. But you know that it's getting under their skin. Yeah. No, I I agree with this. This is uh, see, this is why we had uh, Tekel on here because we get the the sage advice that no one wants to admit to themselves. You you speak the truth when you speak about uh, content creation as a whole that you are putting yourself out there to the public's judgment. And I think what people don't want to understand but kind of have to is that you cannot please everyone. You will not be liked by. E- everyone because it's impossible someone out there is going to hate your guts and you can try everything in your power to please them and it just it's not going to happen um and i think it's more prevalent with people that have been in the scene for a little bit longer and as you said the the startups right now they say it doesn't get to them and then later on it eventually does get to you you can be in this industry for a very long time and in any industry it does it's not just uh, content or esports broadcasting or things like that it can be in your day-to-day job as well where um someone might not like what you do or they just inherently just don't like you as an individual um but seeing as we're talking about uh, the local scene um We've seen a huge influx of new esports organizations, uh, teams being formed, um, casting events going on, streamers, content creators, compared to a couple of years ago when you could count the amount of creators in the scene on two hands. What's your opinion on that? How do you how do you feel about that looking back to where everything was so quiet and now everything has boomed. There's so many new people on the scene. There are people making um, uh, esports organizations and teams and everything looks like it's flourishing. How, how does that make you feel? It makes me feel so happy because I felt for so long that the, the space was so restricted to no offense, Rusty, but just straight white males. I mean, that was it, right? That that was those mm-hmm. were the those were the those were the loudest voices. Those were the only voices. Those are the only voices. Uh, and it was a very specific type of person that that was involved. It was normally middle to higher income, someone who could own a PC, uh, normally a white male and a straight white male, and that was it. So the narrative was very restricted and it's it's exciting me now we see more and more like you said streamers coming in and organizations and we're seeing people of of different genders and skin colors and beliefs and and different lifestyles and and all of that different economic situations all coming through and that's important because in order to create a thriving space you you need to be able to speak to the population and and when i say the population you need to have people that other people can identify with. So it excites me that there's there's all these new faces, new ideas. Because also, not only is it great for gamers who want to be involved and being able to see people that sound like them or look like them or have shared life experiences, but also it just creates far more interesting stories, right? So it's a far more dynamic space and it makes you as a creator or whatever you want to call yourself, change the way that you think. So you can look at things, you see new content coming out that's, done in a different way because someone has a different life experience to you and it can really make you go oh hold on like that's really cool why did they do that how do i learn from that so i just think that it's it can only benefit the space that's fantastic you know it makes me proud i've now been redubbed in the scene as uncle rpl um because i've been here forever and now i have this beard that is now part of the brand on brand you know uh part of the content creator identity so to speak um 
But I feel also, and I don't know if you share the the opinion on this, a couple of years ago when, like you said, it was just straight white males, um, being more predominant in the scene, and I put my hand up there because I've been here since forever, um, there used to be a stigma where content creators were compared to like your bigger content creators, like your Markiplier's, PewDiePie's, um, Jack Sectic Eyes. And there was the stigma where people didn't want to support local streamers at that time because they were emulating too much of those bigger creators. Now, when I look at the scene, we are moving away from that comparison and everyone is starting to come into their own form, um, adjusting how they do content, adjusting how they do or present their personalities. Do you think we are past that stigma that South African content creators have their own identity now that we're not being 100% it's it's obviously not 100% out of the way but I feel we are at that point where content creators locally are identified by them and not just called a carbon copy of a bigger content creator compared to overseas with us. Nope. <laughs> That's the short answer. Uh, I, oh, here we go. Let's, that's fine. Let's go for it. That, that's the point of let's, this. Let's piss off everyone who pays the bills. Do I think it. brands are to blame for this, to be honest. Okay, so I, I must be, I would appreciate this. I've obviously got sponsors who I work with, um, who sort of long term sponsors who are phenomenal at letting me use my voice and do things my way uh, and don't put me in a box. But I think I've worked with a lot of brands over the years who put you in a box. So their favorite thing to do is to send you to say, okay, cool. We want to work with you. We want to create content with you about this laptop that we're launching. Cool. Then they send you four videos from some big content creator overseas. We want it to look like this. <laughs> this is what, I mean, this is what Ninja did. Do it like this. I mean, I just use Ninja because I keep seeing his rebrand everywhere. But like as an example, that's, that's Ninja. Do it like that. And that to me is where the problem comes in. I also know with more established creators here in South Africa. So Grant Hines, who's been around longer than all of us and is incredibly talented at his job and is just creates things on a whole other level. I am well aware uh, that people get hired to do a piece of content about a laptop and then they get sent to Grant Hines' video. Make it like this. <laughs> Grant Hines has a very specific personality. He has a very specific style. He knows his voice. He knows what his style is. But when you send a video like that to a new to, to a new person who hasn't found their voice yet, who hasn't quite figured out who they want to be, of course they're going to emulate it because they want to make the brand happy because we all need to pay rent, right? So of course they're then going to try and, and copy that style because they believe that that's what people want. And then you'll get told that you're just a copy of whatever they're doing. And, and I think that that comes from the corporates. I understand that they're also just trying to play safe, right? Their bosses have told them that they want something like that and there you go. But I think corporates struggle to to give a fair brief to, to new creators and allow them to find their voice. And then I also think we as society are to blame for this. So I, and it's not even to blame because the truth is I, when I started, we find, I'm trying to think of the way to word this. We find inspiration from, from those that we want to emulate, right? So we'll we'll watch someone and be like, wow, I want to, I want to be like this person. I watch Shocks. I'm in love with Shocks. As she's a League of Legends desk coach. I think she's the best esports broadcaster in the business. And she has always been, her and another commentator called Pansy have always been my inspiration. Um, so I'll watch, I used to watch Shocks and see her do certain things. And then I would try and mimic that, you know, like copy certain ways she asked questions or certain ways she said things, which is, it's copying you know at the end of the day but it was me trying to feel it out and then I think as I got a little bit more experienced in my role and realized that I actually you, you you're not shocks you can learn from shocks so go see what she's doing and why that works and and how she words things in her body language and and you can take some of that but you've still got to make it your own um so you still need to have your voice you can simply learn from her and then over time expanded out and now there's there's a lot of different commentators that i watch and I, I try and see what they're doing and what their unique style is not to copy but to see how they did that and, and how i can adjust my style but that takes years and, and i think that like all people start in the beginning going okay cool i want to do this this is who i think i am but now i'm going to watch because we watch we learn from other people right so i do think that there is still a a, a sort of a 
copying type of thing that happens, but that's part of the growth process. I think what's really exciting now for me is that we're no longer just emulating those big names you mentioned. There's people that emulate a Gron Hines, you know, that they want to emulate Gron Hines because they that he's the benchmark now, not, you know, Markiplier or whoever else overseas. I think it's exciting that we're seeing South African names become the benchmark. Um, so I think that hopefully will change things up. But I do think we still struggle a little bit to get out of that weird shell of like, this is our uniquely South African voice. We don't have to, we don't have to do what they're doing overseas because we are not overseas. We are not in Europe. We're not in the States. We're not in China. We're here in South Africa. Let's use our own voice. I don't know if any of that made sense. I feel like I just rambled for a gazillion minutes. <laughs> no, made perfect sense. And, uh, you, you do mention quite a high benchmark. Um, I mean, I've known Grant personally in a capacity. He's a, he's a great friend. He's, uh, he, knows, he knows how to create diverse and engaging content. Uh, same as yourself. Don't ever put yourself down. That's also part of this podcast where we he prays where it's necessary. Grant Hines is a way nicer human being than I am. I feel like I'm a little bit jaded and dark in my soul, whereas I feel like Grant is still... I think if you opened us up, like my my heart has a little bit of black on it and darkness. Whereas I think if you open Grant's up, it's just like it's like okay. a Pikachu would pop out. I, That's I, what I am happen. okay. So you've watched the first episode of Pokemon, like the original, right? And you saw what that Pikachu did to Ash, right? That is secretly Grant Hines. I'm exposing mm-hmm. him. I'm exposing him. Purely because I don't think he can hurt a fly. I I respectfully disagree. Have you seen him play Overwatch and rant as a Widowmaker? That man... I mean, I have seen that. I have seen that. Exactly. So you should know that that man hides very much deep, dark, chaotic... What would Grant Hines' alliance be in D&D? I would honestly call him chaotic neutral. I wouldn't call him chaotic good. No, I think he's all soft and squishy on the inside. Is he's chaotic neutral, but we can that's the point of the podcast. We can share and have a different opinion and still be friends. That is something that um, I feel a lot of people don't understand about the scene is that we can have a disagreement and we don't have to hate each other, um, which has been a little bit prevalent in the scene. I've tried to distance myself away from all of that stuff. So, from my side, um, content creators need to understand that we are not competition and now now we're heading into the 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 jab part of the the pie of them podcast where we really go into the crust here my opinion locally it's great to see how many content creators uh of multiple diversities come out but there's a lot of issues between a lot of people um and i mean that's going to happen in any environment but i think the big takeaway for me is we don't have to be in competition with each other just because someone is successful it doesn't automatically make them your enemy you can learn from people instead of breaking them down what what do you think I mean, I just go to gym now, so I haven't been involved <laughs> in all of that for a while. So I don't really have an opinion on it, man. I just, I just go and run on the treadmill or jump on something, or you know, I, I just, it, you can't, yeah, I just. It is I, I it is. Uh, look, I, you know me. Um, I've been in this scene for a while, and I keep hopping on that, like I'm some old guy remembering his his glory days. Um. I try and help as many content creators as possible because my journey was wrought with very much doing my own thing. Um, My family did not believe that I could do this. They did not. My mother, bless her soul, I love her dearly, but she didn't believe in any of this. Uh, Neither did my siblings. Not a lot of my friends believed in it. So I've had to build a very long arduous journey to get to where i am and um, my philosophy is if i can help someone get out there uh so that they know someone is out there helping them then it makes their journey just a little bit easier and uh coming back to your story of esports i feel like that did help a lot of players in the scene get the recognition and the story that i feel they deserved and you were that and still are that platform. I'm not talking past tense here, chat. This is still happening. Um, 
you are that platform that that gives them that voice and that story and on behalf of them and myself as well because i enjoy all of your articles every post you make is always fun to read and to to experience and intake and ingest um thank you for all your hard work seriously i know there's a lot of people in the background as well and we will thank them accordingly but seriously to to yourself thank you for just being a pioneer in the local scene in esports and content and just being just a generally awesome person and you can't tell me otherwise because i was at rage i've met you in person in an elsa dress and you were just mm -hmm. absolutely darling to me so i mean i got you i, I got your number there what a nerd thank you <laughs> i don't say compliments Listen, well, so that Let's that's copyrighted on, on. <laughs> that is copyrighted you can't use my lines <laughs> Let's just move on. Compliments uh, are weird for me. I don't know how to handle them. Uh, too bad. So sad. This is one of those. This is one of those podcasts. You will accept your compliments because they are from the heart, and I mean it. You can trust old Uncle RPL. I, I, I have to rebrand now. I actually do. I have to like completely change my name, put on like a little bit of gray in my beard, and just be like, "You kids, back in my day, we didn't know what Twitter was." Those kind of things. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, so um, I have a bunch of rapid fire questions for you. All right, as we're starting to get into the end of the podcast here, and I can smell that pie baking beautifully. Do you smell it? Do you smell it? It smells divine. Okay. It okay. Smells like pumpkin pie. I'm so oh. hungry now, man. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone on this podcast is going to complain that they're going to be hungry because when you hear a pie oven, you immediately can imagine a pie just beautifully rising in that oven, that filling just crisping up the top of the. Okay, now I'm now I'm hungry. Stop it. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to give you ten rapid fire questions. All right, you can answer them yes, no with your own answer. All right, um, or you can skip them. But preferably try and answer all of them. Okay, so here we go. Favorite esports game? PUBG and CSGO and. Yeah. <laughs> I started off with a rough one, chat. <laughs> PUBG for Battle Royale, CSGO for first person shooter, FIFA for everything else. You just lost my entire Apex Legends fan base. I can't believe you would do that. <laughs> uh, PUBG's the OG, man. Oh. Favorite singer? Favorite esport, by the way. You said favorite esports. So uh, I presumed it's the one that I want to watch. Not Like if I had to choose a battle royale to play, Apex Legends every time. Okay, well, well, we'll, 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 we'll get to that one. But thank you for answering rapid fire question number five there. <laughs> at number two. But fa favorite esports to watch, you said PUBG. Okay. And CSGO. And CSGO. I love watching CSGO. It's supposed to be rapid fire, CSGO. but I love it. Um, CSGO is phenomenal. Like, I feel like anyone can watch that and just get into esports. Yep. But I like watching PUBG. Like, my personal one is I, I quite enjoy PUBG, but at CSGO too. I can't uh, choose between the two. It's like choosing between your two firstborn children. They're twins. They were born at the same time. I can't choose. <laughs> what an analogy. <laughs> hide, hide your kids, everyone. Okay. Uh, favorite singer. Damn, son. Um, it can be from be any genre. Anthony Kiedis from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Nice. Good choice. Good choice. All right. Uh, this is a dumb one, but favorite color. So favorite band. I just want to be clear. Favorite, it wasn't favorite band. It was favorite singer. Favorite like, singer. Favorite, favorite singer. My favorite band. But Anthony Kiedis is my favorite. Sure. Okay, give, cool. us, give us your yeah. favorite band as well. Let's, let's, let's add to the controversy. Green Day. Every time. Da -na -na -na. <laughs> Uh, favorite color don't ask why orange ah excellent she is one of the 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 pie oven uh, followers chat now we know <laughs> favorite <laughs> local person uh, personality it doesn't have to be in the gaming industry it doesn't have to be uh uh my my boy um robbie collins he is a stand-up comedian and he's just the best stand-up comedian <laughs> he makes her oh this is triggering so to anyone watching i i just it's a trigger warning um so i have quite a dark sense of humor um 
and he, <laughs> Robbie Collins, the first time I ever saw him, he made the most horrific suicide joke. Um, but I understand that comedy oh. is a way of dealing. With, comedy is the way is is a way of dealing with trauma. Um, and the joke, if you, it was quite a long joke, uh, and the the trauma that that was that, that he was expressing, he did so through this joke. Uh, and at the end, we were in this room of people, and I was I think there were like two of us that laughed. No one else laughed. Oh dear! Uh, they didn't laugh because they didn't laugh because if you laughed, you thought that you would be offending him. But I laughed because I realized he was doing this as a means of expressing his own trauma. And I thought it was the best thing ever. And since then, I just think Robbie <laughs> Collins is, I don't know if I can swear on this. Uh, is you go the, for the it. Shizzle. He's the, he's the shit, man. Uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd say Robbie Collins. <laughs> also, like, I'm not, I just want to be clear. Like, I don't think suicide is funny at all. It was just the, the way that he was dealing with his pain through, through comedy. I, I, I oh, identified with and enjoyed, uh, just to be clear, so that no one suddenly cancels me on the internet. <laughs> okay, favorite international personality? Taika Waititi. Taika Wahuti? Uh, yeah, Taika Waititi, the best, one of the best directors. Uh, he, he's not only one of the best directors, I'd say he's one of the best uh, filmmakers of our generation. He is the man responsible for uh, the original What We Do in the Shadows, along with his, his friend Jermaine, uh, the original movie that came out. So if you've never seen What We Do in the Shadows, go and sort that out right now. Uh, he also wrote and directed Jojo Rabbit, which is an incredibly, again, so this kind of gives a, a, a hops with the Robbie Collins. Like he takes like very, Taika Waititi takes extremely serious issues and turns them into satire, which is how I deal um, with with my stuff as well. So I just related very hard to him. Jojo Rabbit, uh, obviously about uh, World War II, Hitler, hate, discrimination, um, but done in a really satirical, funny way. Uh, he's got a stack of movies, but you will know him as the director of uh, Thor Ragnarok. Uh, he plays Korg, the, the stone man in that, and he is also the director and one of the writers of the next Thor that's coming out, Thor Love and Thunder. Uh, he does... He does those movies, um, but that's not his best work. You need to go watch Jojo Rabbit. Everyone should watch Jojo Rabbit <laughs> till the end, every time. Excellent. Okay, so you kind of skipped one of the questions, but you said you play Apex. All right. Now we're going to get to the triggering part of that because it has a sub-question. Who is your favorite champ? For Apex? Mm-hmm. Are we talking about Apex now? Yeah, because you kind of like answered, what game do you play in your spare time? As Apex. So Mo I've got a list of questions under that one as well. There we go. There we go. Mozambique, yeah. Mozambique, yeah. Oh, she's driving me mad. Uh, no, uh, G uh, Gibraltar, just because he makes me laugh, because I always feel like his belly would shake. <laughs> Big old Santa uh, belly. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I can see it. I can see it. Okay, favorite gun to use? I mean, I'll pick up wh whatever I can, except. Not the Mozambique, yeah. Okay, but I'm okay. I will defend that gun. All right, it got a buff, and it's a little bit better than it used to be, but not by much. Dude, I used to just run around and <laughs> you punch people. <laughs> no, no, I was just constantly be like pinging it, Mozambique, yeah, Mozambique, yeah, Mozambique, yeah, just to like drive everyone insane. Uh, that that was my absolute fave. But I pretty much pick up anything that I can use so long as it's got like some semi-automatic to it uh, that normally works for me um no snipers I'm not very good at those so I just avoid 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 but like like the, the usual I just pick up what I can you know what I like about Apex Legends as a game mm -hmm. um from a so in other games like some guns are just rubbish <laughs> and other than <laughs> I mean the Mozambique was rubbish for a long time but Apex Legends, like any gun you pick up, you can still do damage with it, right? If if you like, it's created in such a way that it is. It, I feel like it can be quite equalized. Like, there's obviously some guns are better than others, but for the most part, like the game is created in such a way that like your weapon isn't going to define how your game goes to a degree. That's like a very controversial statement that we lots of people <laughs> disagree with me. But I'm telling you now, there are other games where you, like there's other battle royals. If you pick up something, it's trash. You're going to die. I feel like Apex Legends is a little bit more freeing in that regard it's my controversial i mean how many controversial opinions have i dropped now i mean, uh, cancel on the internet for that the one. If answer, I turn around and say that the answer the you're looking Legends for gun, 
is yes. That's the answer you're looking for. <laughs> okay. Apex Legends gun. I love that. I'm like, oh, it doesn't matter what gun you pick up in Apex. You still have a fair chance of winning. And there's going to be like a bunch of Apex players being like raging in front of their PCs <laughs> now listening to this being like, that's stupid. B, she doesn't know anything. Like I'm telling you, go play another Battle Royale. Apex Legends guns are, are far more <laughs> forgiving than any other. Okay. So... What we do on this particular podcast is we go dive a little bit deeper into the gaming history of our guests, right? And I happen to know that Miss Tech Girl is a Rainbow Six Siege fan, or perhaps used to be. So I oh, must I still ask. Am. I love that game. I, I must ask. Rainbow Six Siege. How many times have you beamed your own teammates in the back of the head? No, so I only do on that when purpose. they. Oh, on purpose so many times <laughs> oh, i was about to say i only i only team kill when you say something silly or when <laughs> when i'm feeling sassy uh but yes i i am i'm the team i'm the team kill queen oh um, no okay. i think that's why i i don't get invited anymore to play because like so <laughs> oh, i'm gonna tell i'll tell you a funny story i've been in so much trouble uh my one of my closest friends and he's also does all my video editing for me is a gen called trinock Yep, Trinock. You can find him at just Trinock on, on the internet and go harass him. Um, I play a lot of Siege with him, and Trinock takes – Trinock at one point took Siege very seriously. Like, it was – we were being sweat. Like, well, he was being sweaty. And we got into this game, and he was – pinging places where we needed to put reinforcements and where we needed to put our gadgets and he he had taken on taken on a very important team leadership role which is desperately needed in any fps team situation you do need a, an igl and he took on the igl role and he wanted to do this seriously so we could win i on the other hand did not want to take it seriously so he kept telling us what to do and i, I think i told him at one point that he wasn't my real dad and then I shot him in the back of the head and he died. And then he switched off his computer and I didn't hear from him for two days. <laughs> oh, no. It might okay. be why I wonder. I, I kind of feel like that's why uh, he doesn't invite me to play Siege with him anymore. Just calling him out on this podcast. <laughs> okay. So for all the Siege players there, if you see someone called Tech Girl, uh, make sure you hide in a corner somewhere. All right. No, because, I, only, uh... I, only do it, I only do it. I only do it to people I know in real life. <laughs> All right, so we are approaching the the end of the the pie oven podcast, and I must say this pie is smelling absolutely beautiful. It has been baked, it has been dissected. We have made something absolutely amazing this evening. So, in typical podcast fashion, I would allow you to plug your things, but on this particular one, I need you to plug your things and then say something nice about yourself and genuinely mean it not something sarcastic not something tongue-in-cheek something genuinely nice about yourself so first go ahead and plug and then say something nice about yourself oh wow it's like therapy i've been here <laughs> before i stopped paying that woman uh uh you can find me i'm tickle za pretty much everywhere on the internet so except tiktok i haven't got there yet uh Probably never will. So Tickle ZA on Instagram and Twitter, uh, facebook.com forward slash Tickle ZA. You can also, I do have a, a Twitch channel, twitch.tv forward slash Tickle ZA. And a YouTube channel, uh, which used to be youtube.com forward slash Tickle ZA. And then I forgot the password and Google won't let me back in. So now it's youtube.com forward slash Sam Wright Tickle. Sorry, super confusing. Uh, and yeah, I talk about esports stuff. I'll share when all the broadcasts I'm working on are happening. And then I sometimes just create random content. And I'm going to say one nice thing about myself. I make the best pumpkin pie. That's, see, why was that so difficult? You took such a long pause. I was going to say something funny and sarcastic, and then I was like, no, you told me I'm not allowed to do that, so we won't be self-deprecating. Listen, that is my spiel, okay? I have copyrighted that for the last 10 years, all right? I will I will start counter-suing all these people. 
I would like to thank our esteemed guest for joining me on the Pie Oven Podcast. Everyone in uh, the comment section, drop who you might want uh, as your next guest if you have any ideas who we could uh, speak about. Grant uh, Hans. Grant okay, Hans. well, Grant uh, Hans. okay. Let me let me tell you a secret that they will know listening to this if they listen to the end. He's the next guest. I can tell the future. There's another nice thing I'm going to say about myself. I'm a fortune teller. <laughs> and she has impeccable aim in Siege when your head is in the way. Um, <laughs> I don't know okay. if you remember this, just to just before we end this. A couple of years ago, I was creating Overwatch fails, like on purpose, like dying. And do you remember the Orisa episode? What did I do? Because it's always something I did. What did I do? <laughs> So we we did a little skit where it was me talking and then you questioning my skill, all right, as an Orisa player. And then I had recorded you playing as Orisa and we were playing Elios with the with a little well in the in the middle. And I went back and checked Hold the pod. Did I just did I just put a shield up and, no, and hide in the corner? No. Oh, what you did was, and it was amazing. You put up the shield, you launched your ball, right clicked, and three of them went into a hole, and I lost my mind. It was the best Orisa play at that point that I had ever seen in my life. But in my defense, I don't have to really defend this, but but to play this down a bit, I I was at that point commentating like top tier overwatch so you learn a couple of tricks <laughs> from from the pros and then when you know someone's filming you kind of toss them out where you can you know so well, I'd, I'd, it's that was stolen remember how we spoke about like copying yeah, i mean yeah. i just stole that from a professional <laughs> player but yes i that was a trick that that i watched a pro do with with her and i realized that it was possible to do it on that map so <laughs> yeah i'm glad someone has that you should send me that clip i'm just gonna play it all the time be like uh, it was beautiful, player, buddy. <laughs> it was beautiful. Um, no, my my, over, uh, my Overwatch days are since behind me. But if you come and check out my my stream, uh, Twitch.tv forward slash Rusty Pie Lover, I have the glorious Bob behind me, commemorated for all the times that uh, he and I shared Overwatch nights together. Very intimate. I'm not going to get into it. This is a it's a friendly podcast. We we, we can't do late night with RPL. That's going to be a little bit weird. <laughs> Um, anyway, so thank you everybody so much for listening. If you enjoyed it, please do leave a like. Uh, this will be on YouTube. I'm going to try and get it on Spotify. I don't know how long that's going to take, but for now, leave a like, leave a comment. Um, please go check out Tech Girl on all the platforms. Please go send her some love. You can use the hashtag Pie Oven Podcast and at um tech girl and myself if you have listened give us your insights um if you were triggered by this um well you know sometimes when the shoe fits uh, uh, y you gotta wear it you know and uh, you can catch me everywhere as well rusty pie lover on youtube twitter facebook instagram tiktok only fans don't ask um i swear i'm missing one did i get them all i think i did twitch youtube I got it. I got it. Okay. I think I got all of them. <laughs> uh, Mr. Echo, thank you so much for joining the Pie Oven Podcast. Thank you for sharing your insight with us. And thank you for helping me bake this beautiful podcast pie tonight. I'm going to go eat some food now. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye, everyone.